Private Stephen Ford, Teeter French, John McKenzie. Awaking on a July morning, they did what such young men might do, boiled coffee, stretched, joked, griped about those they were trained to obey, and in a quiet inner voice, prayed to God that this would not be the day. Privates Byron Welch, Charles Baker, and Captain Joseph Perriam. For them, though, this day in July 1863 would indeed be the one. On this day, they would die. Careening bullets, hot fragments from an exploding shell, or a thrust of tempered steel, one of these would make their blood leave their mangled bodies. They would be buried far from their home soil, on a shaded hilltop just outside a town called Gettysburg. In a few months' time, a long-shanked man in a beard and top hat would come to that hilltop to praise their measure of devotion. But what did they die for, these young men in blue, these soldiers of the Army of the Potomac? And why should it matter now, 150 years later, to us, their distant, self-involved heirs? It matters because they died for an idea, the idea of us. They died for the idea of a nation unlike any other on the planet in their time. These young men in blue died to preserve an idea we rarely speak of anymore the Union. Yet, within their idea of Union lay all that we casually salute now at ball games, picnics, and parades. Within their idea of Union glimmered the hope of freedom for the chained man with welts upon his back, for the woman bowed from care and the casual scorn of men. Their gaunt president eventually would give best voice to this American idea in a burst of autumn eloquence on that shady hilltop. But first, over three July days in 1863, Mr. Lincoln's nation would very nearly be lost on the fields and hills outside Gettysburg. Never was it more at risk than on the battle's second day. In the urgent hours between four and dusk, crisis flared from one thunderous blood-soaked end of the battle line to the other. At the dire moment, from Little Round Top to Cemetery Ridge to Culp's Hill, a few regiments in blue found it within themselves to race into the smoking maelstrom instead of away. Among them, the 20th Maine, the 1st Minnesota, the 9th Massachusetts. If their courage had been one ounce less or come five minutes later, the America we know would have been divided, distorted into something we would not recognize today. The men in gray were that relentless, that close to their goal. But in that noisy dusk, young men did the necessary and often fatal things to blunt Robert Lee's last invasion, to pull the idea of America back from the precipice. This was no push-button war of drones and bombs. It was intimate, hand to hand, ugly in the moment and horrific in the aftermath. The wounded moaned in the crumpled fields, and the surgeon's saws grew dull from use. It was chaos unleashed upon an ordinary Pennsylvania landscape, gentle ridges, a peach orchard, a wheat field, a warren of boulders known as Devil's Den. In these three days, more Americans died than in the long anguish of the Iraq War. In three days, 52,000 either died, were wounded, taken prisoner, or melted into the mist. Corporals Peter Marks and Timothy Crawley, Private John Ellsworth, Michigan farm boys, Massachusetts clerks, cocky Irish from Brooklyn. In dying so horribly and in such droves, they bequeathed us our nation. That is why this battle anniversary matters. As the long man in the tall hat once said, this is why we must never forget. Captain Charles Billings, Lieutenant Warren Kendall, Private John Reed. Let us not forget them.